All right. Thank you, Joe, for telling us about your little family business. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Bill Lovett uh, uh, from Pilgrims. Uh, he uh, is, serves as a chief uh, executive officer and president there since uh, 2001. Uh, and he grew up on a, in the family poultry business, which uh, eventually became Holly Farms Corporation. So another, another uh, speaker with a, a, a deep roots in agriculture. So it feels like I've been at Pilgrim since 2001, actually 2011. And I did grow up in the chicken business on a, on a chicken farm. So thank you for inviting me today. It's a, a real honor to be able to do this. <clears throat> I want to inform, inspire, and I think you'll see perhaps challenge you to think maybe a little bit differently about farming and agriculture. Because you see, we think about agriculture and food production, right? And many people stop there, but you know, I believe that we do much more than just produce food. I believe the American farmer uh, not only produces food, but the American farmer uh, spreads prosperity. And, and even, I think, more noble than spreading prosperity around the globe <clears throat> is we advance social progress, if you really think about it. The roots of our improvement as mankind, as the world, is, is spread in advancing social progress. And I think it starts with agriculture, and it's really exciting to think about what's going to happen the next 30 years and the opportunities that we have to continue to advance social progress. You know, not only can American agriculture be prosperous, but I think we can be the tip of the spear in, in strengthening and maintaining rural America and in spreading prosperity to many nations around the world, thus remaining the world leader in advancing social progress. But let's be honest. The challenges that we face are going to be large and they're going to be numerous. I think we have to make sure that we incent the private sector to both invest and innovate uh, using both human and, and financial capital. And I'm really excited about what I'm hearing out of the administration uh, along those lines. We have to have less cumbersome and ineffective regulation. Again, uh, you know, my, uh, my ears perked up when I heard Secretary Perdue uh, this morning talk about uh, getting rid of, of uh, you know, useless regulations. And then we do have to depend on our government for positive breakthroughs in advancing uh, trade uh, as, as we seek to, to uh, sell our products uh, around the world. So I read a, a very interesting article just this past weekend uh, author's name was Charles Mann. Uh, it's in the Atlantic Magazine, March edition. I don't typically read that magazine, but I found this article fascinating. Uh, the title is, Can Planet Earth Feed 10 Billion People? Subtitle, Humanity Has 30 Years to Find Out. And in that article, uh, Mann uh, states, and this is really surprising to me that he would state this, affluence is not our greatest accomplishment, but our biggest problem. And he goes on to explain that in 1970, about one in four people on earth were undernourished. Now we've made a lot of advancements since then, and today it's about one in 10, okay? So we still have a lot of hungry people in the world, but we've added 11 years to the average lifespan, and, um, uh, we've had a lot of people, hundreds of millions of people move into the, what we would call the middle class. But therein lies the challenge, therein lies the paradox. As we make social progress, as we do all of these great things, we create even bigger challenges. And our progress in spreading prosperity creates this challenge to produce more with less. And living in a world that is increasingly skeptical about the technology to do so. And I think you heard from both uh, speakers earlier about, you know, some of the roadblocks we face in consumer preferences and, and perceptions as far as technology goes. So I just thought that that article is fascinating uh, regarding what, what we're talking about today. So with that said, 
you know, I think there are three priorities that we must embrace and, and fly into in order to uh, sustain this prosperity that, that I'm talking about. First of all, we have a growing and hungry world to feed. There's no question about that. Uh, we'll give you some, uh, some data to support that. Uh, as I alluded to before, the second critical priority, and, and I would submit if we don't do this one, then we can't do the first one, and that is uh, maintain and strengthen a strong rural America. And then finally, and again, these are iterative, meaning that uh, we have to do the third one in order to make the second one successful and, 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 and so on and so forth. We must do both of these in a most sustainable way. And so I, I want to talk to you about uh, how our company actually uh, has, has uh, approached this in a second, but I'll start with uh, feeding a, a hungry and growing world. The, these statistics have been thrown about uh, frequently, and, and I don't think they come as any surprise to you. But by 2050, we're going to be able to, to or have the need to produce 70% more food. I think, uh, uh, Jim, you, you were saying it's 50, but whether it's 50% or 70%, it's an unfathomable number uh, if you really think about it. And I want to share with you what we are doing at Pilgrims. And yes, uh, Joe, there may be a, an advertisement or two for Pilgrims in my presentation, so you'll have to, to bear with me. There, uh, we've become the largest uh, chicken company on the planet with our most recent acquisition in, in the UK and, and Europe. Uh, today, we supply about one in three chickens in the UK. We supply about one in four uh, chickens in Mexico and about one in five chickens in the United States. We produce about uh, 47 uh, million chickens a week, uh, 55,000 team members, 52 plants. And what I've said about that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is how we've done it and why we've done it. How we've done it is we become much more efficient over the years. Um, you know, we, we decided about seven years ago that we had to be the best operator if we were going to, to accomplish our mission and reach our vision. That meaning more efficient than our competitors, the lowest cost than our competitors. We had to grow, we had to innovate. And if you really step back and think about why that's important to do, well, the reason is providing opportunities for our team members, our customers, and people around the world. That's, that's the whole point. So enough about the, the, the company for now, I'll come back to it. By 2050, again, we're going to need a hunt, whoop, all that didn't come up. We're going to need, if, if the slide were fully populated, it would show you we would need 100 million more tons of chicken by 20, uh, 2050. If you think about it, 100 million tons more just to satisfy uh, demand. Uh, much more beef, much more pork, so the world is going to need more protein is, is the whole point here. And if you think about it, we live in a world today, especially here in the U.S., and I've noticed in the U.K. and in Europe, where consumer interests, consumer perceptions, and consumer preferences are not necessarily in alignment with doing this. And so I would ask you this question. If I were to survey you in this room today, and, and I said, or I asked, do you want your food to be produced locally? Do you want a more transparent food supply chain? Do you want to be able to see and touch and feel where your food is produced? Do you want to feel good about it? What would the answer be? I think resoundingly you'd say, yes, I, I, I really want all of that because we've been conditioned as consumers because our food cost is so low here relative to, to any other expenditure or any other place in the world. We take a lot of this for granted. But having said yes to that question, let me show you a picture of what that might look like. Okay, so a couple of things about this slide. It's a guy in a van with five goats milking. This is in China, by the way. And, you know, is it locally produced? Well, sure it is. Is it fresh? Sure it is. 
Is it transparent? It's right there, right in front of you. <laughs> is it sustainable? No, I, I, that's the point. Not sustainable. So, again, in the U.S., we, we have this sort of push for local, locally grown and organic and, and a lot of things that aren't necessarily in line with producing enough food to feed the world long term. So we have to balance then perception with reality. Having to feed 2.2 billion more people by 2050, uh, we have to overcome these, these challenges. We have to do a better job of talking to consumers and, and convincing them that our food production system uh, must change over time and it must change for the right reasons. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about food security and supply. And I believe that in the next 30 years, I think this is going to be perhaps one of the most important geopolitical issues that all governments and all people have to grapple with. And I would challenge you uh, everyone in agriculture, let's, let's not allow this to be a flashpoint. Sure, it can be a strategic critical issue, but if we allow it to be a flashpoint, uh, you know, we think the price of oil is, is a political flashpoint today. If, you allow, if we allow the supply of food uh, to, to, uh, to, to not keep up with demand around the world, it, it's certainly going to be something that we all have to deal with. So. I want to talk about each one of these. Uh, I think you heard uh, Dr. Adenasi talk about uh, the growth in Africa earlier. He's absolutely right. A Africa as a continent will double its population by 2050. And I think his message today is absolutely on target. You know, will Africa be prepared to produce enough food to feed that growing population? It's not just Africa. It's, it's a lot of places around the world, China and India. Uh, some places in South America, and will we be in a position to 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 fuel that demand and meet that demand for food? Changing taste, uh, I just dealt with that. Uh, organic products in the U.S. is ever more popular. We we just uh, invested in the largest organic certified organic chicken uh, operation in the world. Uh, it's a great operation, but do you know what would happen? if the American consumer demanded that every bit of food in America be organic? Do you know how many acres we would need? More? A hundred million. Now you saw from the charts from The Economist earlier, we, just in eight commodities, we employ 255 million acres. There's only about 320 million acres that are available for production. So to think about adding 100 million, it's just not going to happen. It's the size of the state of California. It's not practical. It's not sustainable. So again, balancing consumer preferences with reality is, is going to be a challenge for us. Scarcity. Um, you know, most, most agricultural land sits on uh, areas where water is scarce. I'm going to talk about water uh, in, in just a few minutes and how important it is to, to our business. But water scarcity is something that we're going to really have to invest uh, in and, and really tackle uh, because it's going to be a, a real problem. I think we're going to need double the amount of water uh, that we use today if we're going to produce that 50 to 70 percent more food by 2050. Prosperous farmers. It's so inspiring to me to see the young people in this room and at this conference, the diversity uh, program, uh, the FFA, the 4-H. Um, you know, I, I'm concerned that most of the farmers I meet today are my age or, or older. And my question is, how do we inspire, how do we get younger people coming into agriculture? Because, let's face it, they don't do much agriculture in Silicon Valley or just around Austin, Texas. You know the. The cool thing to do now is get into technology. Well, guess what? We can be in technology, as has been said today from this podium, and also be in agriculture. So how can we get young people to get more involved in, 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 in our agriculture? Uh, nutrition, uh, safety and affordability. Um, let me hit that one first. 
I'm impressed and thankful that FSIS and USDA has recognized the need to modernize our inspection systems. Uh, actually, uh, our, our company had the first pilot plant or the pilot plant for NPIS uh, a few years back to test that system. We have five out of the 20 hemp plants now uh, involved in the industry. So we have to continue to think about how we change our inspection systems to make food First of all, safe, because that's non-negotiable. And second of all, uh, how can we be more productive and continue to make food affordable? Uh, nutrition, you know, how do we incent young people to learn more about nutrition? We're involved in, with 4,500 school districts uh, uh, in the school lunch program. I think by 2020, we'll have, we will have produced about a billion meals for that school lunch program, and that's a great program supported by USDA and we're, we're glad to be a part of it. Accessibility, this is uh, an issue that's, that I've taken personally. Um, I read an article in the Washington Post uh, uh, a couple of years ago about food deserts. If you know what a food desert is, it's defined as an area where people don't have access to transportation and, they, and fresh food is 10 miles or more away from where they live. And uh, our company and myself uh, partnered with uh, uh, a group called Desire Street Ministries started in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans where they try to rehabilitate these communities that uh, just uh, needed uh, need another chance. And I went into Lakeland, Florida uh, uh, in the past year and, and learned more about the Lakeland community and the fact that people in, in that part of Lakeland don't have access to fresh food. And so it's been sort of... Um, a burning desire on my heart to figure out how we can help as a food company uh, uh, bring fresh food to people who don't necessarily have access to it. So accessibility is uh, very important. Food waste, I think we waste about a third of, um, of our food that we produced according to FAO report. Uh, to me that's just, um, we have to do something about that. If you add collectively the, the value of all the food that we waste around the world, it's almost $800 billion, which is just astonishing uh, to me that, that we would allow something like that to happen. And then finally, transparency. I think one of the reasons we have a perception problem with consumers is we need to be more open and we need to be more transparent in how we do things and why we do the things that, that we do. So these are just a few, 10 of the the big issues that I think we're going to have to grapple with and face if we're going to feed a hungry and growing world. Now, the second critical priority that I mentioned is uh, maintaining and strengthening a strong rural America. We know that rural America continues to change. Um, you know, definitely I grew up in rural America. Rural America is, is, is a lot different today than it was in the 1960s and 70s. And when I grew up, we have real problems now in rural America. Some articles have, have, uh, have called rural America the, the new inner city. I don't happen to believe that because I still go to or live in rural America, and, and I don't see that. But it, it's, it's not that we don't have problems and we need to, to face them. Uh, but at the same time, let's not forget that our modern agriculture and food system is still big as it relates to our total economy. $6.8 trillion of our, what, $19 trillion GDP. Uh, so the uh, fact of the matter is we do matter. Uh, we account for 25% uh, of the jobs are 43 million uh, in this country, $2 trillion in wages, $146 billion in exports. So we matter, but you know, let's not take what we have for granted. Let's not take what we've produced uh, for granted. Let's make sure that we strengthen uh, rural America and, and make sure that that stays the core of our, of our society. It's misunderstood if you survey, 52% of the people are gonna think that farms are owned by big corporations like, like ours. Fact of the matter is that's not true. 97% of farms are family owned and 88% and of those farms are considered small family farms, and as fa small family farms are, I think, the cradle of America, and that's where we started and that's where we are today. It's definitely 
um, it, it's definitely the foundation of the company that I run. We could not have a business without small family farms, and I want to share with you what that means. So around the globe, uh, we use a, a contract farming system where we contract with over 5,000 small family farms to raise our chickens. We own the chickens, we own the feed, uh, we uh, supply technical advice and medicine if, if needed, and we pay almost a billion dollars to do this. 700 million of those dollars are spent here in the U.S. Uh, supporting 4,500 of those over 5,000 uh, family farms. And we, they, they raise 2.1 billion chickens annually for us. And, and again, we would not have a business but for those small family farms. And you know, when I was growing up as a teenager, I was a part of one of those small family farms growing chickens, and so it's, it's personal to me. And one of the most um, uh, enjoyable things that I do in my job now, and, and I don't get to do it as much as I'd like, but I go around and meet these families and, and hear about what, what their challenges are, uh, think about how we can help them be more prosperous, uh, because to me, this is America, the small family farm. We also support rural America by investing in FFA. We're a big sponsor of uh, Future Farmers of America. I was a member myself in high school. I think it's very important. I was also a part of 4-H uh, back uh, when I was younger. And uh, so uh, that organization is very, very important to us. We're, we're uh, honored to be, be a sponsor. We also give back to land-grant universities. I know that's been mentioned earlier today. Uh, we just gave a million dollars to Texas A&M University to refurbish their, uh, their poultry feed mill on their campus uh, for research and teaching. Uh, we've given uh, several hundred thousand dollars to Auburn University for the same purpose and we'll continue either direct investment to these universities or through uh, a program with uh, U.S. Poultry and Egg where we fund about 1.2 million dollars a year in research for um, poultry nutrition, poultry disease, uh, uh, how poultry production infects the environment, so on and so forth. And we're also proud uh, uh, sponsors of uh, trade and foreign ag programs as our industry exports about 20% of our production around the globe. And if you consider uh, sort of how agriculture works and the shifting demographics and the, the shifts in growth around the world, consider this. In the world today, between Brazil and the United States, those two countries make up 68% of the global chicken trade. So over two-thirds of chicken around the world comes from those two countries. It's pretty um, uh, easy to understand why. It's because we grow corn and soybeans in both these countries cheaper and more effective and more efficiently than any two countries on Earth, and I think it'll continue to be that way. So trade as uh, Joe said earlier, is going to continue to be very important to rural America uh, as we go forward. Finally, the, uh, the, the, other, the third critical priority that I'll talk about today is how do we do this in a sustainable way? Going back to the, the gentleman in China with the five goats in a van, that's not sustainable, but how do we maintain a sustainable food production system in, in the world? Well, we know, and Secretary Purdue alluded to this earlier, three billion people uh, in the next 30 years will move into what we know as the middle class. And what happens when they do that, they improve their diet. And they improve their diet by eating more protein and eating more complex carbohydrates. And it takes more, obviously, resources to do that. And so, given our current state, if we stay where we are, it'll take one and a half times the resources, and we just flat don't have those, okay? That's not, that's not reality. So we have to do things differently in, in the future. Um, as I said, um, we're going to need more protein. Um, I'll use Mexico as an example. The Mexican consumer eats 400 eggs, table eggs per capita, twice the American consumer. Why is that? Because as they move from the informal economy to the formal economy, they make perhaps three times more money, and it's not a lot of money to Americans, but it's a lot of money to them. The first thing they do is improve their diet by eating protein. 
The cheapest form of protein in Mexico is a table egg. They might have one or two a week in a t wrapped up in a tortilla. As they get more money, the next thing they do is they begin eating more chicken, and that's why chicken is growing in Mexico faster than any other meat that, that is produced. And so that's going to continue as we have more Mexicans move into the middle class. That's going to happen all over the globe. And so we're going to have these Mexicos all over. And 20% of U.S. chicken uh, uh, exports go to guess where? Mexico. So that's the model that we're going to see in the future. What is sustainability? We hear that word a lot these days, but here's the definition that, that we choose to use. Responsibly meeting the needs of the present while improving the ability of future generations to responsibly meet their own needs. It's, it's really not all that complicated. Okay, We did a corporate materiality analysis about three years ago at Pilgrims to find out what really is important from a sustainability standpoint, both with external stakeholders and internally. And here's what we found. These five things are what we focus on. Product integrity, team member health and safety, animal welfare, water, and our energy use and efficiency. I'll throw a number out and I think it's going to surprise you. How long does it take just our company around the globe to use over 300 million gallons of water? A gallon of water for every American citizen. How long do you think it would take us to use that much water? It'll surprise you. One week. In one week, we use one gallon of water for every American citizen on the planet. Now, we've reduced that water consumption uh, significantly in the last seven years uh, by, by almost 30%. And we have a goal to reduce it more by 10% by 2020. And our water use is really more, uh, we're more efficient with water than our competitors. But we're not satisfied with just reducing it to the levels we have today. If we're going to need twice as much water in the future, we have to do something to create that water because, you know, we have what we have, right? So when, when, I, when, I, when I talk about our sustainability program, and I would, I would encourage you to go online and, and see our 2016 report. Even though it's 193 pages, there's a lot of pictures, and it's really pretty interesting. Uh, but we, we've made our sustainability part of our culture. It's not a report that we do every five years and we just put, you know, in the, in the closet. It's something that we challenge our teams from one end of our supply chain to the other to make a part of our culture and to make real progress on all of these fronts. So efficiency is, is really the key here. And no matter what food production system we have, we have to learn to do more with less. Uh, I'm proud of our industry as we've used genetic selection to improve feed efficiency. So back in 1925, um, it took 4.7 kilos of feed to produce a kilo of meat. And we got that down now to 1.6. We've raised the, the weight of the bird significantly, and the growth rate has improved during that time. The mortality is six times better than it was. So we've made a lot of progress in the chicken industry. Who's been the beneficiary? It's been the consumer. Uh, is really, if you go back 10 years, chicken today at retail is no more expensive than it was 10 years ago, while the price of ground beef, the price of pork has gone up significantly. So we're at a crossroads, and I think here's the question. Are we on the road to ruin, or are we on the road to prosperity? I don't think it's, uh, it, it's not a hard question for me to answer. I know the American farmer, as Secretary Perdue said earlier, he knows the American farmer. The American farmer is going to continue to be prosperous. One thing, though, that we have to deal with in reality, and I, this is one of my favorite quote, quotes by Jack Welch said, when the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. So we can't sit on our hands and step back and say, well, so what if the world changed? We're going to continue doing what we do. That's not an option. I heard uh, someone else say recently, uh, change is inevitable. Growth is optional. And so 
I think that really speaks to what I want to tell you next, and that is uh, how do we deal with change? We embrace change. Change is a part of our DNA. And one of the things that we do continually is ask ourselves the question, how do we connect people with a purpose and their passions? Because I found when you connect those three things, things happen. Things that you would not imagine could be possible happen. We talk a lot about technology and innovation. I think the greatest tool of technology and innovation is the human mind and the human spirit. And so you see our vision in the middle there become the best and most respected company in the industry. Why? Creating an opportunity of a better future for our team members. That's how we connect all of those. And we think a byproduct or the end result of that will be a more sustainable uh, food system and a better future for people around the world. I t talked about change. How do we embrace change? Distinguishing what our customers want versus what they need and how do you know? Well, they're going to pay for their need. Listening to our consumers, not telling them that they're wrong, but understanding what those needs truly are. Creating uh, or celebrating diversity of agriculture. Uh, I think that's appropriate with our, uh, our young diversity uh, group here. And then partnering with our key customers, our government and regulatory agencies to create and drive market value. So what's agriculture's imperative? I, I shared with you our imperative. What do you think agriculture's imperative should be? Well, you could read the FAO report, and I think it's a good report, but it says, on the path to sustainable development, all countries are interdependent. Sustainable development is a universal challenge, and the collective responsibility for all countries requiring fundamental change in the way all societies produce and consume. Reads sort of like a government report, right? Well, I've never been, uh, I've never, and I have a lot of respect for people who work for our government, but I've never had that experience, so I have to say it in my own way. And so my own version of this and connecting people and purpose and passion is when farmers and scientists and business people and governments work together, we will feed a growing and hungry world. Rural America will remain the strength of our nation and social progress will accelerate. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking to you today. I look forward to your questions.